And I primarily work on the daddy drivers at Digi, and that's what I do. I, I maintain the, the, the drivers. So this presentation is probably going to be the least asterisk y presentation that's here because um, it's, for somebody who's uh, implementing asterisk, there's not going to be a lot of information here that you'll probably be able to directly use. But it's more if you, I'm, I'm figuring you're here because you're just kind of interested in it. And also, I like watching the the kernel development process because I, I oftentimes get ideas about how I can improve the daddy drivers and also improve um, asterisk even though I don't really work on it. So if, uh, if you're here looking for a lot of useful asterisk information that you can implement, this is probably not the, the right talk for you. So what I'm going to overview, uh, the things that I'm going to go over are the ePoll and timer FD, uh, the, the looking at the timekeeping in the kernel, the tick list, the high-res timers, and the clock source. I'm just going to briefly touch on some of the developments in the file systems, the ext4 and the betterfs. Look at, talk about some of the discussions that have been surrounding the scheduler changes that have gone in the kernel during the 2.6 series. Um, look at the receive packet steering. Um, talk about the big kernel lock removal. That's a, that's a huge thing that just got finished relatively recently. Um, touch on the differences between the slab and the slub memory allocators and then open the floor for questions. So to start with, uh, looking at the timeline of the asterisk releases that I figure a lot of people are going to be familiar with and then matching them up with the releases of the kernel, uh, you can kind of see that early, when asterisk 1.0 was first released, we're at the 2.6.9, and that was the base kernel for the RHEL 4 release. Um, and then up now to the current uh, Linux kernel release that's 3.1. But the, some of the big kernel releases in there are the 2.6.18 kernel release that was picked up by Red Hat Linux for their... 5.0 version, and uh, the 2.6.32 kernel, which is going to be the base for the 6.0 kernel, and it's also used by a lot of the Debian distributions. And the, from, from my standpoint, the 2.6.32 kernel has a lot of the features that, that I personally like to see on a regular basis. But this just kind of gives you a, a general overview of the, how the kernel's been evolving related to, to the asterisk releases. So first, uh, ePoll and timer FD. Let me just actually get a show of hands. How many people here are C programmers and Okay, so most people, okay. So uh, the, the kernel uses file descriptors in order to uh, give user space access to the kernel objects. So, so on those file descriptors, you have I.O., and that I.O. can be blocking or non-blocking. And blocking I.O. is where when you issue a read or a write, the user space will wait until the operation is complete. Whereas non-blocking, you just tell the, you advise the kernel that you want that operation to happen and, and it'll happen at some other later point if it can. So multiplexed I.O. Is the, is the act of waiting for multiple file descriptors to become uh, ready to read or write. So in Asterisk's case, in channels, sometimes you'll be waiting on sockets, but you'll also be wanting to wait on a daddy timer to see is, is it going to time out if you don't get your packet in time. So, so that's a common operation up in Asterisk. Um, Asterisk will spend much of its time waiting for multiplexed I.O. In, in a normal running asterisk system, that's what it's going to spend most of its time doing, is waiting for file descriptors to become writable or readable. Um, ePoll, which was first introduced in the 2.6 kernel, the, the very first 2.6 kernel, is Linux-specific. It's not portable across other Unixes. And what it does is it eliminates the need to constantly um, build up your list of things that you want to wait for. So if you're waiting on three file descriptors, to, let's say two sockets for your RTP streams, a timer, that means every time you process that, you would have to build up those three things, pass it to the kernel. The kernel would then walk all those file descriptors, add those, that file descriptor handle to the wait list in each of the drivers. And that, when you add that up, it takes a bit of time. So when you can look at this chart, you can see that for 1,000 oper 100,000 operations, the performance increase that you get from when you're using ePoll, that as the number of file descriptors that you're waiting for, which is on the left, goes up, the, e the time that ePoll takes is pretty constant. So a normal asterisk system is not really waiting on 10,000 file descriptors in a single poll call, but even the small improvements at the lower numbers when you add it up over time is, is important. And I, I firmly believe that optimizing small pays dividends in the long run when you consider the fact, when you add in frequency scaling and other things that your system can be doing to reduce the power usage. So I, I'm, as a driver developer, uh, microseconds matter to me. So so even for small number of file descriptors, ePoll is a definite win. So when you look at that and how Asterix does its timing, this is where timer FD comes in, is because when Asterix was first released and it was using Daddy for its timing, Daddy provided a file descriptor that 
asterisks could wait on even if there weren't, wasn't any uh, hardware, uh, telephony hardware in your, in your service. Because the POSIX interface, the, that's the portable operating system. The, what's the, I don't know what the uh, acronym for POSIX stands for, but it's the standard that all the Unixes try to strive for. And the POSIX timer interface gave you kernel objects, but those objects weren't weightable in the poll and the select with multi, uh, multiplexed I.O. So very early on, there was a performance increase for Asterix to use Daddy to do its timing, even if it wasn't, even if it wasn't uh, to a real telephony device. So early, I think in the 1.6 release, Asterix added the res timing pthread because a lot of people didn't want to have this dependency on Daddy when they were running in the virtualized environments where you might not have access to your kernel sources to build your Daddy drivers. And so res timing pthread eliminated the dependency on Daddy for the timing, but it added a lot of overhead because what it had to do was create a separate thread that was then sleeping with the, the higher, you know, when, when you sleep in a thread, you can use the high res timers, but then in order to wake up a channel driver, it would then have to write to a pipe, and that pipe is, the uh, file descriptor that you get when you create a kernel pipe is pullable. So, so when you're using res timing pthread, you have a thread that's sleeping, it wakes up, writes to a pipe, that pipe then goes, sends a, a byte to the channel driver so that it can wake up as if it had a daddy timing, and that all that extra overhead causes problems. And I've, I haven't really heard anybody who uses res timing p in production and, and likes it, to, uh, to be honest. I think there are probably other bugs lurking in there. So in the kernel 2.6.25, they added timer FD right into the kernel. And this was a way basically to do the same thing as daddy. So when you're using daddy, if you, you basically open dev daddy timer, you get a file descriptor that you can then set your weights on. Wait, now with 2.6.25, you just use timer FD create. That file descriptor can then be passed around and used everywhere the daddy timer open file descriptor was. So, um, so for people who are interested in running Daddy in the cloud, or I mean, running Asterix in the cloud, or running Asterix without Daddy, this is uh, a key development in the kernel that enables that. Another thing, though, is uh, still if you're using Meet Me or the Page application, even Asterix 10 is not completely Daddy free. So just uh, that's still something that we're moving to, but we're, we're not there yet. Speaking of time in general. Um, in 2.6.13, you were allowed to change your, your time slice that the kernel was interrupting, and I don't know if anyone's had the need to do that. Um, the config hertz setting in the kernel configuration determines how many, times a uh, how many times a second the Jiffy's counter updates. And the Jiffy counter is, the, is the, the smallest amount of time the kernel typically uses to keep track of. So if you're doing schedule timeouts in, in the kernel, you're always doing those in Jiffy increments. So, if you're, so for example, if you have your, your system configured with a config hertz of 100, then that means that the smallest amount of time you can do anything is about 10, 10 milliseconds. Most desktop distributions will have it configured to 1,000. Um, like a CentOS 5 series has it configured to 1,000. Um, some of the server, um, server distributions will configure it for 250, which makes about a four millisecond interval. But this has an advantage because the, the, less, the, the more frequently you wake up to check if, you're, if you need to run something, the lower the latency of your system. But that comes in overhead because every time the timer fires and it needs to go look at all the, uh, all the processes on the run queue, that adds overhead, so it's a balancing act. Um, but again, most users don't really need to do anything about that unless you're really trying to drive your hardware at the, at the edge. So, so but if you're ever wondering why you sometimes get scheduling uh, jitter on your processes, typically it's because the config hertz value is set to a lower, a lower number on older kernels. Um, newer kernels have uh, high resolution timers, which was first introduced in 2.6.16. And what this, these high resolution timers do is they kind of separate the Jiffy's calculation from the general timekeeping in the system. So, if you're using POSIX interfaces to do clock nano sleep or general, general sleeping, they're using the high resolution timers that give you that nanosecond resolution or whatever the, your time source in your kernel, uh, kernel can provide, which is typically the time step counter on your CPU, which is giving you sub nanosecond resolution. Um, so now you can sleep and wake up at uh, higher, gran higher granularity, but still the scheduler is not really running off the high res timer, but it does add uh, it decreases latencies when you're, when you're using the, the POSIX interfaces. Zaptel in Daddy Dummy added support for the high resolution timer um, in, uh, that was in Daddy, that was in Zaptel. Uh, I think I said that. Uh, 
but it wasn't really, it was not really needed because when Daddy is mixing audio on a pure soft conferencing, it's really mixing audio in 20 millisecond increments. So if a schedule, even running at 10 milliseconds, your frequency that you're going to check to see if you need to do anything is twice as fast as the, as the standard block size that you're having to process. So the high-res timer is, is kind of a, more of a intended as a workaround for the fact that Daddy wasn't using the total number of time passed in case it didn't get its timer interrupted at the right time. So I don't know if a lot of people initially was trying to set up asterisks in the cloud with earlier versions of Zaptel and the timing, you know, they're running Daddy tests and the timing was getting all messed up. You could either switch to high-res timers if you had a new enough kernel, but newer versions of Daddy don't have that problem because it, it actually keeps track of how much time has passed to, to, to account for that. Also, uh, in 2.6.21, tickless kernels were introduced with config no herds. And, and this is primarily a power savings optimization that was made. So normally, if you set your, say you set your, you have a CentOS system, it's interrupting you at 1,000 times a second. Every time the interrupt fires to wake up the CPU, that consume, that the processor has to come out of its low, low sleep state and look to see if there's any task that has to be run. And if there's no task, it just goes back to sleep to wake up in another millisecond. So in 2.6.21, they added the config no hertz option, which if there's nothing scheduled to time out or run in a period of time, the processor can stay in low, uh, its lower, uh, its sleep states longer. So you know, I copied one, one uh, observation off a website here where somebody was, was with a 250 millihertz config hertz setting that they were getting at about a two, uh, a two volt Increase, uh, decrease in power usage. So again, small things over a long period of time, they add up because one of the things that I hear about is how people are saying that the total cost of ownership of your VoIP systems, the power consumption of all the different devices is, is, should, should not be ignored. And, I, and, and again, optimizing your drivers and your kernel to use the least amount of power and the, le and the least amount of CPU time, which can allow the CPU to stay in its lower power states, is all, is all a win. Another uh, added improvement for the tickless kernels is that it allows virtual machines to be more efficient because if you're running your Linux kernel on, say, VMware, if it doesn't need to wake up to, to determine it doesn't have anything to do, VMware can run more virtual machines on the, on the same system for your Zen hypervisor. So it also has an advantage for, for running in virtualized environments. Um, also, sticking with the timekeeping theme, in 2.6.18, uh, the clock source abstraction was added to the kernel. And the clock source abstraction basically allows time sources in the kernel to be established like device drivers. So two of the more common ones that are in use now are the uh, timestamp counter, the TSC, um, that's provided by your CPU. I don't know if anyone's ever seen TSC unstable warnings when they boot their computer. Um, but basically that's because the, the kernel is determining that the, the timestamp counter is has overflowed in the period that I was looking at, and then it can switch to the APIX programmable interrupt timer for getting its, its sense of how much time has passed. So the advantage of using a timestamp counter is it's fast and it's easy to read, but it may vary. And again, this is a power savings, a power savings feature because say you have a processor that has frequency scaling, like the early speed steps. If you're using your timestamp counter as your time source and it's changing its frequency, you don't really have any way to know that. So, so basically, adding the clock source allowed the kernel to switch between using the, the APIX programmable interrupt timer and the clock source to use the most reliable clock source uh, that's available and do its own performance power trade-offs. So again, theme, lower power, lower usage, better for systems that you're just leaving on all the time. Uh, moving forward onto some of the file systems, the ext3 file system was kind of the standard. Well, if you go back earlier, there was the ext2 file system, which was the standard. Linux file system. EXT3, the primary feature that it added was journaling. But in the 2628, they came out with the, uh, or for, uh, merged in to the mainline kernel, the, uh, the EXT4 file system. And the EXT4 file system is generally considered the best file system that you can use right, right now. Um, it increases the size. That doesn't really matter for asterisk systems because most of the files are really smaller. They're just recording voicemails. Um, but it did um, allow, uh, add in these extents, multi-block allocation, and delayed allocation, which helps with performance and decreased f fragmentation. So essentially what extents are is on an, on an EXT3 file system, say you have a 100 megabyte file that you want to allocate and start writing to, it has to go and find all the blocks to fill up that 100 megabytes. Um, and it, it, it allocates 4K blocks 
to, for the 100 megabytes, I mean, for the, to fill up the complete 100 megabytes. Extents allow you to go in and say, well, I have all this, I have these 100 megabytes worth of blocks that I want to allocate. It'll allocate one group contiguously to give you those 100 megabytes. So basically, it cuts down on the overhead of, of going and finding all the blocks when you, when you start writing to the files. But it also tries to keep everything together if it can, because it'll, it'll search for the, the part that it can find, it fill the extent um, while it's searching for the available blocks on the, on the disk. Um, also, the EXT4 file system added support for fast checking. So, at the, when you, this has an impact for phone systems, because if you're booting your phone system, I don't know if anyone's ever had it where it's, uh, it runs as FXE because you haven't run it in a certain period of time, and then that adds all this extra latency until when it can come up and start processing phone calls. So now, with the EXT4 file system, it can keep track in the super block, or in the uh, inode for the, for the block, what other parts of the, of the file system are unused. So when the FSCK runs on the first, when it comes up and runs, it doesn't have to check the unused blocks to see if there's any corruption. So it can, that can result in a five to 20 times performance increase when you're running your FSCK on um, boot. So that does have a direct impact on asterisk systems. Um, also, they have nanosecond timestamps they've added by increasing the, the size of the field of the timestamp in the inode. And this is good because uh, previously your timestamps were only limited to single seconds. So now, with nanosecond resolution, you can get uh, you can get better information about what happened when in the system because the seconds uh, not really not really good enough. EXT4. One of the design goals was that it was backward compatible with EXT3. So you can basically mount your EXT4 file system on your existing EXT3 file system, and uh, it also supports online defragmentation. And Previously, with EXT2 and EXT3 file systems, if you wanted to defragment it, basically what you do is you'd create a new par partition and copy all the files over and then replace it. But now with EXT4, online defragmentation is supported by the addition of a new IOCTL in the file system that allows, that allows a user space defragmenter to say that it wants to replace the find new blocks and move the blocks from one file to another atomically which you can't do with the XT3 file system. So if you're doing that kind of maintenance on a regular basis, it'll, it'll reduce the, the need to do that. Um, the way, the super way forward with the file systems is the better FS file system. And this is a, this is kind of like the mixture between an EXT4 file system and um, volume management, where it has a file system level mirroring or striping. So if you have multiple block devices, multiple disks in your system, you can just mount a single e, a better FS file system on those two blocks, and it'll mirror and stripe them depending on if you want redundancy or performance. It'll do online volume growth. You can just add in a new block device, and with better FS, it'll let the file just naturally scale to that. Um, it it uh, has online block balancing that if you see, if you have a file that's being heavily used and all the blocks are on one of the block devices, It'll allow certain blocks of that file to be moved to another device to allow more throughput on your, on your disk. Um, it allows cloning of files. So I don't know how many people, when they're setting up a new, uh, you know, especially like you're copying in call files, and you have to basically create a new call file and then move it because the move, file, uh, the move operation is atomic. With BetterFS, you can actually go ahead and copy a call file into <coughs> Your, your spool directory because the copy operation is atomic through cloning. Um, there's also some support for wear leveling on SSDs in BetterFS, and it also has support for compressed blocks. So if you have a fast processor, slower block devices, the compression in BetterFS is, I think, the root of most of the performance increases that people have been seeing on single CPUs. However, that being said, uh, there's talk of, uh, it might already be decided, but uh, Fedora Core 17 uh, switching to BetterFS is its default file system, but everything that I've heard it's kind of uh, great for people to play around with, but it's not really considered hyper dependable yet. So EXT4 at the current time is the best file system to use, and I think that's the default in all the current distributions that are being used. Um, some other file systems, I don't really know much about any of these other file systems, but they're out there. I thought I would put, put some information up here for people who are interested. Um, and this was basically, I, I took this off the Arc Lineage website about deciding what kind of file system you, you want to use. So the, you know, the FXS, great for um, large files. RiserFS, good for small files. Um, and then JFS, uh, 
uh, faster boot up time, and then I already talked about ext4 and better FS. So, but I can't. I don't really have any experience with those other file systems, so I can't really talk about them. But just in general, even even Ted So, the maintainer of the ext4 file system, agrees that better FS is the direction that Linux is going. So if you wanted to get on the bandwagon and start playing with the file system, better FS is probably the one that you want to want to start looking at. So scheduler improvements. Um, this does. This could have an impact on an asterisk installation, but whenever I try to measure it, I can't. Because I oftentimes will change the schedule of parameters when I'm developing the drivers to see if I can get more throughput off the drivers. But I've never seen, uh, I've never been able to tweak the schedule improvements and see any difference in, in what I'm testing over PRI, PRI links. But it's worth talking about because there's been a lot of discussion about it on the, on the mailing list. So one thing, this, these schedule improvements really only apply to the normal scheduling class. Because in the kernel, there's real-time scheduling classes and there's normal scheduling classes. So the real-time scheduling classes are the FIFO and the batch processing classes. And if you have a process that's in one of those classes, say you have the, a process that's in the FIFO class, if it's the highest priority process in the FIFO scheduler class, it's just going to run until it sleeps or schedules itself away on its own. And the round-robin real-time scheduling class will, will uh, do something similar, but all the processes in the round-robin class at a particular priority will time slice amongst each other, and no other processes will run as long as one of those want to run. But those are the real-time scheduling classes. These schedule improvements more pertain to the normal, the, what's called the normal or, or batch scheduling priority classes. So the most normal, when you're running your system, there's, there's nothing running in the real-time. They're almost all running in the, the normal, uh, most normal application uh, processes are running in the normal scheduling priority class. So, the CFS, the completely fair scheduler, was merged in 2.6.23, and it was designed to basically get rid of the concept of the time slice. Um, and it did, this, it did this by adding, it essentially creates a red-black tree that it's used to determine which process to run, and then each tree has a number, amount of time that it ran. So uh, maybe uh, if I go back to how the 01 schedule, which was the previous scheduler worked, it basically run, it had run queues, and this is probably what most people are familiar with. It had run queues, and then when the scheduler timer tick came in, it would look at the run queues and pick off the next task that was ready to run. And then that one would run for its time slice unless it's scheduled away, and then it would go back onto the end of the queue that was needed to run. So depending on how much time that these processes use of its time slice, you could get, you could get unfairness in there because if you didn't use all your time slice, you never got that time back. So the goal of the completely fair scheduler was to allow all the processes to basically keep track of how much time they actually had the CPU and were running for so that the, so that the, the scheduler could let each process run for its completely fair a lot of time. And that was the, the overall goal of that. But when it first came out, when it was merged in the 2623, there were a lot of reports that it wasn't, that there was a performance uh, degradation with it. But uh, uh, somebody called, uh, named Khan Kalivas posted a, a BFS scheduler patch to the kernel, which caused a lot, of, um, a lot of talk on the kernel mailing list because he was saying that under his desktop gaming workload, that his BFS, which is a, uh, uh, <laughs> it's not a very nice acronym, uh, Brain F Scheduler, um, he got a lot of performance increase, and that, but the good thing about that is that caused a lot of discussion to happen, and Ingo Molar from Red Hat, who developed the Completely Fair Scheduler, basically took what Con Calivas was demonstrating as BFS Scheduler and, and improved it. So still the default scheduler in Linux is a Completely Fair Scheduler, and even back then when Con Calivas was doing his performance numbering and saying that you know, for normal desktop usage it wasn't as good, um, CFS still performed better on systems with a lot of processors because there's, you know, there's um, like silicon, uh, silicon graphics, you know, they'll have a thousand way CPUs and a lot of the early schedulers, they just don't scale at that level, whereas the completely fair scheduler was doing a better job even initially at that. So CFS is the best over all around scheduler. But again, for asterisk, asterisk is spending most of its time sleeping, or it should be anyway, it should be spending most of its time sleeping, waiting for IO. It's an IO bound process. So this type of uh, hyper interactivity is not really needed because the smallest granularity that most asterisk systems really care about is that 20 millisecond default chunk, uh, default packet size on a, on a uh, like a ULAW RTP link. So most of this stuff, I haven't seen any impact on asterisk. 
Also that creates criticization recently was the, this, group, this idea of group scheduling. So what this is about is normally when you have your processes on your system, all the, the tasks are scheduled uh, relative to one another. But if you had, say you had an open terminal and you were compiling the kernel with a high parallel J number, but you're also watching a video in your browser, that the, all the threads, each of the individual threads in that kernel build would then be competing with your video playback application and, the, and would basically cause stutters and skips in your video playback. What group scheduling does is it allows, it allows groups of processes to be scheduled based on the, uh, the container or the group that they're in. So when you open a shell, that creates a new group as far as the kernel is concerned for that session. Then all the tasks that are spawned underneath that session are all assigned to that one group, and then that group itself gets, is, is scheduled. So, so the whole process group gets an equal amount of time with the other applications that are running on your desktop. So this was, this was a big deal when it came out because a lot of people were very excited that they could do heavy, intensive tasks in a console and still do other things in the browser, and it didn't look like it was skipping, and, and it just felt, felt better. Again, probably, probably not related to uh, Asterisk so, so much because most Asterisk installations are a dedicated server just running Asterisk, or at least they probably should be. So, so this does, but it's, but it's interesting. It's interesting to see what people are doing. And then finally, not really a scheduler improvement, but it does, it does impact scheduling is the move to threaded IRQ handler that's recent. And this was, this was recently merged into the kernel, and I, I can't remember the actual version of the kernel that this was merged in, but it came from the real-time tree where if you want to reduce the amount of latency that any high priority task has to when it can run, one of the big reasons that it, they can't meet those deadlines is because interrupt handlers are taking too much time running their tasks. So Daddy would be an especially good example of this because the echo cancellation happens in the interrupt handler. So if you have a lot of channels, you're doing software echo cancellation on them, all that, time, the, that could cause the scheduler to miss all its deadlines on any real-time task that you had to run. So the way the real-time developers got around this was by moving all the hardware interrupt handlers into these threaded interrupt handlers so that the interrupt handlers themselves were scheduled just like all the other tasks. So now you could, if you had a, high prior, a, a process up in real-time that had a deadline, it wasn't competing with the interrupt handler. In the, the, the version that was actually merged in, it wasn't, it's not pure threaded handlers. They had um, one part that actually ran an interrupt context and then a delayed part so that um, if you had an inter uh, interrupt handler that needed to run a certain part because you had very tight timing constraints, you could still run that in, in, your, uh, in the actual hard IRQ context, and the rest of the interrupt handler could run in process context, but you can still do that now if you wanted with, with uh, work queues, um, if you're running a, writing a device driver. So you still can't, it's still on a, a driver by driver basis. Somebody, you, as a system administrator, you can't just say, I want all my interrupt handlers to run threaded. You can with the real time trees, but you can't with the normal trees. But it's just kind of trying to encourage driver developers to go ahead and write more of their interrupt handlers threaded. Um, Daddy doesn't really use those as far as Asterix is concerned because the timing constraints in Daddy is still they're pretty tight because most of the interrupts need to be serviced within a millisecond. And I haven't yet been able to see a threaded interrupt process where I was able to service those in a millisecond depending on how many other processes the, the, uh, the user has configured. So with Daddy, since I don't really have a lot of control over how people are using it, it's easier just to keep the, the interrupt handlers running in the interrupt handler. If I, was doing, if I was a complete system integrator and I had control of the whole system, I would move them out to the threaded interrupt handlers. Um, in 2.6.35, another relatively exciting development in the kernel is this concept of receive packet steering. And what this is, is, is it allows, as it says here, it allows packets, the receive packets to be processed in parallel. So in, before 2.6.35, um, unless you had a network card that had separate transmit and receive queues, what would happen is the, the, the interrupt handler would run, start processing the packets that are coming off the interrupt handler, deciding where they're, they're supposed to go, and walk them all the way up the stack before they put them on the queues, the kernel queues of the sockets. Receive packet steering kind of moves more of that processing of the stack off to other CPUs very early in the process. So, so if, you, if, you, if the driver gets a packet, it can basically look at a hash to see which socket um, uh, that's serviced by a particular CPU is servicing the ports that this packet's destined to, and before it even walks it up the stack, put it on the queue for that other process. 
And this actually, this decreases the CPU utilization, CPU utilization because it can allow more of the processors, if you have a, like an eight-way system, it allows more of the processors to be involved in decoding the packets coming off a single, a single NIC. And you can see uh, when, the, when the commit message came from somebody at Google, um, this is what Google was seeing on, say, an E1000 with an A-core. They're seeing a almost 30% reduction in the CPU load with a, a doubling or tr almost tripling of the number of packets per second they could receive just with this one patch added to the kernel. So is this related to Asterisk so much? Uh, you know, Asterisk is, you know, most of the packets are still coming in at 20 millisecond intervals and they're coming over slower links if you're doing termination or origination. So your bottleneck is typically not gonna be packet processing coming off the interrupt. But again, it's one of those things that, uh, you know, even if you can save you know, sub millisecond times on your packet processing, that's more time that your server can be sleeping, lower power state, uh, not incurring power and cooling charges. So, so this is, this is uh, I, I think this is noteworthy and exciting. Um, also, I don't know if anyone's heard any of the news about the removal of the big kernel lock, which has happened just recently within the, was finally removed in the 2637 kernel. And I think the kernel 3.0, you, you don't even have it as an option anymore if you want to, want to include it. And so in 2.0, that was the first version of Linux that actually supported symmetric multiprocessing. So they put the big kernel lock in kind of like the Python gill so that when anybody called into the kernel, um, only one of the CPUs could actually be doing anything in the kernel at a time. So clearly that, just like in Python, that was a scalability problem. And as time is gradually over time from the 2.0 until the final removal, they've been making a finer granularity locks. So, so when it was finally removed in 2.37, it wasn't like this big performance increase because all the locking had basically already been granularized. Um, now, Daddy, you know, when, when the change went in where it was no longer an option, Daddy stopped compiling because there were still assumptions that Daddy made in the octals that it was being protected by the big kernel lock. So it was really only in 2.5 that Daddy actually added its own fine grain locking to get around the, the limitations of the big kernel lock. So, and what this means is that, um, say you're calling IO mux or something from asterisk, waiting for uh, multiple events to happen on a channel. Previously to Daddy 2.5, those would have been serialized in the kernel, but now, now they're, they're not. So, um, and I think that's why they actually removed it, because they wanted people who maintain the drivers to actually go ahead and get their act together and get the uh, dependency on the big kernel lock taken out. Um, this is kind of related to the scheduling, um, but the, the kernel preemption was, the default kernel preemption model on CentOS is, is the voluntary preemption. And, well, let me take a step back. Does everyone know what I mean by kernel preemption? So normally, uh, in, in when you're doing time slicing and processing, if a, if a, a fully preemptible uh, time slicing system, a, cr a process can actually be interrupted by the scheduler and then a new a task swapped in. So that was a lot of the early differences between Windows and Mac, where Mac had cooperative multitasking and Windows had a fully preemptible multitasking. The kernel, when pro the kernel was always fully preemptible for a user space as soon as SMP was added in, but in the kernel it wasn't. It was always um, non-preemptible in the kernel. So any, any process in the kernel would not be interrupted by the scheduler earlier on. They added a, um, in 2.632.13, they added the voluntary preemption where every time a process said that it, was, it could sleep, that actually gave an opportunity to run the scheduler right there. So this actually, it does have an impact on reducing the latencies that, that you see. And, and I actually have seen changes. If I go to a, a system with a lot of processors, turn off the preemption, and you'll see lag when you're typing, typing on the console. But again, most distribution using the, the voluntary preemption is not anything that you need to worry about. And there's also the real-time tree still out there. If you, if you really have tight timing constraints, you can go ahead and grab the, the, the real-time kernel and build it, and then that gives you hard timing constraints. Like if you say, I need this task to run every millisecond, and it can only delay by hundreds of nano, uh, microseconds, the real-time kernel can give you those kinds of guarantees depending on what type of drive, unless you have a bad driver that you have installed. And, and finally, uh, the, the slab and the slub allocators, and this is, a, again, not something that really impacts an asterisk installation except that it, the, the, the idea of using slab allocators speeds up 
almost all the operations in the kernel because it, they basically have pre, preset caches of objects so that if you're, say you're opening a file, you need to create a new file object, you can just grab it off the slab cache a lot faster than, than scanning and looking for a block that you can, you know, like a normal malloc call, scanning it and finding it. Um, in 2622, slub was added because one of the problems with slab is that all the objects that you kept on your free list had meta information associated with them, like where the net, you know, you just popped them on the end of the queue and popped it off. The slub allocator got rid of all that overhead by adding extra information to your page table so that the, so that if you had a memory page, uh, the kernel, the default memory allocation unit in the kernel is a, is a 4K page. Um, if you have a, by adding extra information where, if, let me just take a step back. If that page is assigned to a slab, then extra information in that page, the table entry, will tell you where the first slab in the, the first object in that slab is located. So it can get, so basically slab got rid of all the meta information associated with with keeping these queues, and that resulted in a significant amount of memory returned to the kernel and the user space. So, again, a lot of a lot of work goes into this, and the, the benefit is just more memory for your processes. And and there is a there was a performance increase in slub because of the simplicity of the single chaining of the objects in these in these caches. So, um, as a kernel debugger or a kernel driver developer. I also like the slub because by default, even on a customer system, it's, it's enabled by default. I can just flip a kernel command line parameter and get debugging information um, from, from, from them without actually having them re recompile their kernel and turn it on if they're using a slab debugger. So the slub is good stuff. There's also the slob. I don't know much about it. And it's just a simple list of blocks. And that was designed for small embedded systems. And, um, but, but I don't have a lot of experience doing anything with the slob. Allocator. So, but I just wanted to say, you know, looking at all these kernel features, I always recommend sticking with the defaults provided by your distribution because keeping up with security changes is is problematic. And most most kernel distributions, I haven't needed on a normal system to compile my own kernel in a long time because all the defaults generally cover me. The only time I, I run newer kernels and release candidate kernels on development systems because I want to make sure that the I'm not going to run into a problem with the drivers being incompatible with the change that's coming down the pike. So if you stick with your defaults, it's good. But it's also interesting following along with the kernel development because all the kinds of things that they're working on in the kernel also pertain to the core of asterisk. Like how do you scale better? How do you uh, uh, use less memory? How do you do all this stuff? And it, it's, all, it's all related, I, th I think. And so it's very interesting to follow. Um, so if you're interested, some of the resources that, that I recommend is the Linux Programming Interface book by Michael Karras, which just came out this year, is probably one of the best technical books I've, I've ever read. I, I really can't recommend it enough. I, when I first got it, I stayed up all night and read like a third of it. And I was like, ah, when's the last time I did that on a technical book? So if you guys see, it's really expensive. If you guys see it, though, I recommend it. Um, there's also the Linux, the kernel newbies on this Linux 2.6 changes website has a breakdown for each version, the new features that were added in. So a lot of times if you're looking, oh, like, I want to use this, but I don't know what version of the kernel it came in, you can go to kernel newbie and search it and say, oh, okay, I can see that, you know, the completely fair schedule went in and this version or went out. Um, but also, who, who here has not used Git? Everyone's, oh, you have, oh, I, I can't recommend it enough. I, I always say, look, Git's one of the few things that I wish was available when I first started my career in development. It's, like the change of going from Subversion and CFS to Git is kind of like going from Notepad to Vim and, and editors in terms of what it allow, how much more efficient I am with it. Um, and the kernel is now kept in Git and it was made primarily for supporting the kernel. And it's really easy to find information in the kernel. Like my workflow before I really started using Git was I had the driver, somebody said they had a compatibility problem. I would then have to go to linuxwiki.net, find the version of the kernel that changed that interface to put the dependency in the drivers to say, don't use this feature if you're not in that kernel. With now, whenever there's one of those incompatibilities, I can just go to Git, find the actual line in the file that was added, and instantly, through this process, go and find the, the version of the kernel that it was in. So it's really efficient um, and makes gripping and, and mining the kernel for information about that, things that you might be interested in really efficient. And I, I can't wait for asterisks to switch to Git. It's, it's a work in progress. Um, the drivers, I think in this next year, I think Daddy is going to switch to Git. Um, there's just a few more things we have to work out in terms of policy about how to do some certain things. But everybody who works on Daddy is primarily myself, another guy at 
Digium, and then Zorcom are the other people that heavily participate. Um, we all have to follow the kernel anyway for changes, so there's not a big learning curve there. So I think, I think in the next year, we're gonna switch to Git for, for Daddy, but don't quote me on that. That's just that's my optimism, optimism speaking. Yeah. So um, at this time, I'll, I'll go ahead and open the floor for questions. And I, I know it's a big topic, and I kind of went through it really quick. So if anyone has any questions that I can't answer, if you send me the email that's related to Asterix, I'll look it up and, and reply. So 